just got one of the most unique perspectives. It's like drinking a boba tea without the boba. Such a delicious soup of information. What is up guys and welcome back to another video. Today we have my May wrap up. I feel like I just filmed my April wrap up, but that is just the way that summer goes, I guess. So I did manage to read a few more books this month. I've been averaging like five or six. I did read 10 this month, so I feel like that's pretty good. The first book of the month was a Mary Oliver book. Um, she writes a lot of nonfiction from what I have read about her. This is a collection of essays. I was under the impression it was poetry. Um, it is not, but the way she writes is definitely very lyrical, so it kind of felt in a way like I was reading poetry. Um, it's really her kind of meditations on nature, the art of writing, the whole creative process. Um, she talks a lot about different poets, um, different writers who have inspired her, namely Walt Whitman. I think she talks a little bit about Edgar Allan Poe, also Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, she does touch on in here. It's a really slim volume. It doesn't take very long to get through. I think it's like less than, it's less than 200 pages. The way that I described it in my notes was that it feels like a palate cleanser for the busyness of the world. So I feel like if you're one of those people who you're feeling really anxious and you just need something that goes at a little bit of a slower pace and talks a lot about nature and the beauty of nature, you can really feel Oliver's appreciation for it. So I do recommend this one if you're just needing a little bit of a break from fast paced life. There were definitely some parts in here about her writing style um, that I definitely resonated with. She talks about like interruption um, and how that's sort of the biggest hindrance in her mind to the creative process and getting into the flow of things. I really liked Bird. That was one that I really, um, I think I almost teared up at the end even. It was, it was very sweet. Um, it's about her like trying to nurse a baby bird back to health, like a baby seagull or something. Um, and then Swoon was another really good one. She documents in detail the um, sort of daily life of this spider living up in, in like the basement, I think, of a house she's staying at. So if you are needing something that just feels like a little bit of an antithesis to the craziness and the busyness of life, this is definitely one that you will enjoy. All right, next up is a tiny little baby one. This is Secrets from the Center of the World by Joy Harjo. Um, and she wrote these poems based off of some Stephen Strom photographs. I was expecting this, like when it, cause I ordered it, a used copy off eBay. I was expecting like a big coffee table book and then this, this little thing came in. And I believe, I don't know if it was her poems were necessarily inspired by the photographs. It seems like that's how they kind of put it together is she did some ekphrastic writing, meaning you look at an image and then whatever comes through whatever writing comes through based on that image is what they paired with it. So she's got some really beautiful poems. I'm going through all of Joy Harjo's work. I hope to do a big video on her, just like I did with Chuck Palahniuk, where I read all of an author's works. And then I basically throw them all into one video and kind of give you a review of everything. This is a little bit different than what she typically does. I don't think she's ever partnered with somebody like this before. As short as it is, there were a lot of really quotable poems in here. I wrote several pages of notes, um, which is kind of impressive because I've read full length novels before and only written like half a page or a page of notes. Um, so you know it's good when I have a lot of notes in my notebook. I'm gonna go ahead and put a couple of them um, that were my favorites on the screen right now. As always, there's really a special something in Harjo's writing that really speaks to um, place and of a time when people were more connected to the earth. So I felt like her writing really, really does pair perfectly with landscape photography. I've never thought of it before, but it really does go really well. I feel like I always leave her poetry whenever I finish one of her books with a sense of gratitude, um, whether it be to like land, to place, to animals, 
um, to other humans and you know people in my life. There's just this essence of humanness that she really captures so beautifully and I think that's why I mean she's been like a the poet laureate I think um, she served for three terms. There's just something so universally human about the way that she writes. Next up was While Time Remains by Yongmi Park. This is um, another nonfiction. I had m a good portion of nonfiction this month actually. I'm kind of finding my way with it. For years I just read fiction so it's been kind of interesting diving into real life stories. Basically with this, Boyfriend and I finished In Order to Live, which is Park's memoir, her autobiography. We finished that, I think last month in April um, and immediately went to the bookstore where this is still on the bestseller list, I believe. She's a North Korean defector, if you've never heard of her before. And there's only been, as far as I know, the number is 206 North Korean defectors make it all the way to the US. A lot of times they end up um, in South Korea or Mongolia somewhere that's like geographically close to North Korea. But this is basically documenting the similarities that she has noticed in growing up in North Korea, probably the closest place to living inside the book 1984 that you could possibly be in in the world today. Everything's incredibly controlled. Most people are living um, at or below the poverty line. There was times growing up where she was literally going out in the field and eating bugs um, to stay alive. Um, and this documents the similarities that she's noticed between America and North Korea. So a lot of the rhetoric that she's seeing is very similar. Um, a lot of the way that when she was going to, I think it was Columbia where she was educated. Yes, she graduated from Columbia. A lot of the similarities she's seeing in the way that people speak in class. She talks about, you know, the different political structures that we have and how it was very difficult when she first moved here to understand the difference between the right and the left. Um, and how she still doesn't really fully understand like what that means. Something she says in the book is that those terms survive only as tools of social organization wielded by the elites um, to police the boundaries of acceptable thought, which I feel like is a very astute analysis. She's just got one of the most unique perspectives because of how she grew up and where she grew up. She talks about how much Americans love to talk about their trauma, how all of us love to talk about our anxiety and our depression, um, but she looks around and all she sees is overabundance. There's just a plethora of food. Um, everybody lives generally in good conditions. Um, and she, I mean, she was living in basically a slum in North Korea. Like I said, going out into a field and eating bugs because her parents left her so that they could go work to try to make some money. Um, and her and her older sister would, you know, if they ate through the rice, that was it. Um, so they would have to like go out in the forest and eat, eat cicadas and grasshoppers and that sort of thing just to survive. So she finds it quite ironic um, that everybody loves to talk about their trauma, but they really have no idea what true trauma is. She talks about meeting really prominent political figures at these fancy dinners that she would be invited to. And it almost feels like she was invited almost as like sort of a you know, an accessory, like a, like a fancy, a fancy accessory, like, oh, I have a North Korean defector at my party. Like nobody really wanted to listen to what she had to say or help. She meets Hillary Clinton at one point, she meets Nancy Pelosi and they just kind of brush her off. Um, and I think Hillary Clinton, she said, promised to say something to try to speak up about the atrocities in North Korea. And obviously that never happened. I know Boyfriend and I recently watched her on the Sean Ryan show on his podcast on YouTube. Um, and he was like, how are you dealing with this? Because she was human trafficked while she was in North Korea. Um, and he's like, how are you dealing with it? How are you, how are you coping with everything? It was really interesting the way that she talked about mental health which is very much kind of the opposite of how we think of it in America. So she's got a lot of really unique perspectives for sure. It's not all that long. So if you're interested in her autobiography, this is a really interesting follow-up. Next up was one of my absolute favorites for the month. Maybe one of my favorites for the year, we'll have to see. And that is Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. So I've seen a couple of um, booktubers talk about this one and they really gave it like such a glowing review. So I went on eBay and bought me a copy for like five bucks. Um, and I can definitely see why they give it such good reviews. So Kimmerer has this amazing way of combining her scientific knowledge, cause she's a botanist with her indigenous knowledge. Cause she grew up learning all about like the Potawatomi tribe 
that's a tribe that she's a part of and then kind of melding all of that into her life so it feels like part memoir so you've got like the science part the spiritual part and then that personal part um and it's just mixed together in such a delicious like soup of information i think her overarching question that she's trying to to get the reader to think about is can we as modern people use this ancient wisdom um, that has been used you know on the planet for thousands of years can we use that to better our modern lives one of the things she talks about over and over again the kind of motif of the whole book is this idea of reciprocity meaning like what can we give back we take so much from the earth um, but then it's like what are we really contributing what are we giving back so it's like everything that she does she's always thinking about okay i'm using you know paper that came from a tree i'm, I'm taking from nature are the words that i'm going to put on it worth it so that that could almost kind of i feel like debilitate you sometimes just from living I, I kind of wish that we still thought about that because we just consume so much and we take a lot for granted she says what would it be like i wonder to live with that heightened sensitivity to the lives given for ours to consider the tree in the kleenex the algae in the toothpaste the oaks in the floor the grapes in the wine to follow back the thread of life in everything and pay it respect once you start, it's hard to stop, and you begin to feel yourself awash in gifts. She talks a lot about um, this age of information that we're living in, where we're all so attached to our phones. She compares us to like the seed at the bottom of the seed packet that never sees the sunlight and is kind of shriveled up and withered, um, which I feel like is, is a pretty fair analogy. She thinks it's, it's really quite simple. We can fix a lot of that um, anxiety that, that we're feeling if we just get out in nature a little bit more. And then her thoughts on gratitude, I also found really, really beautiful. Um, she says, while expressing gratitude seems innocent enough, it's a revolutionary idea. In a consumer society, contentment is a radical proposition. Recognizing abundance rather than scarcity undermines an economy that thrives by creating unmet desires. Gratitude cultivates an ethic of fullness, but the economy needs emptiness. There's been so many times where I was feeling like I was missing a little something, and so I go online, I do some retail therapy, and then by the time the things arrive, I don't even remember what I bought. It doesn't really, it doesn't help me in any way. Um, and I feel like we've just become consumers um, and what she presents in this book is really is a really powerful different way of living she even talks about language how like the english language um, is fitting for a consumer society because it's very noun based um, and how in potawatomi there's a lot of verbs everything's alive everything's breathing um, even things that we don't typically think of as animate objects like maybe the ocean or a tree I said her depth of knowledge and loving explanations of nature's processes would make even the most stolid atheist question the divinity in nature and the earth's unfailing ability and willingness to nurture humanity despite all that we take. I think that idea of reciprocity is what I take away from this the most. What can we give back? If we're taking, 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 that's unsustainable, so what can we give back? So, highly recommend this. All right, next up was an audiobook that I listened to on the Audrey app. Um, it was a free audiobook that I got through the Storygraph um, app, which I will put my stats on the screen right now because I find that app so interesting. I've been keeping my, um, my books, like keeping track of everything on Pinterest, which is like so basic, but I've been doing that for years. So an alternative to um, Goodreads is Storygraph, and I like it a lot better because it's like very stats focused. Anyway, they do giveaways a lot of times. And The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman is one of my favorite short stories. It was one of the first ones that I read in like my American Lit class that really captivated me um, and kind of creeped me out a little bit. It was originally published in the 1890s and I remember, I remember loving it, so I thought I'd give it a listen this month. Essentially, it follows a woman um, very similar to our author who was, she was basically told to, to go on bed rest, like just, just lay in bed, don't do anything, nothing at all, don't even go outside, just lay in bed and that should cure you. But obviously being trapped inside a room um, with this very disturbing 
dingy yellow wallpaper does not go very well. You can imagine um, that one might lose their mind a little bit. So it's basically you're, you're watching the narrator's psyche sort of slowly unravel um, and it's quite disturbing and push the envelope a little bit at the time. The beginning is very, very familiar very mundane. Um, I love the innocence about it. The narrators, she's kind of resigned to the fact that like, okay, this is, you know, this is what my husband and my, who's also her physician is telling her what to do, but she's still hopeful that the rest cure is gonna, is gonna fix her. It's lovely in a demented sort of way where you kind of watch her just like totally totally unravel. I know you can find it in um, collections of Charlotte Perkins Gilman's work. Um, her Land is another short story by her that I really like. That one will forever be one of my favorite short stories. Then next up we have two Joy Harjo poetry collections. So like I said earlier, I'm going through all of her work. I want to do a video on her. Um, first we've got Conflict Resolution for Holy Beings. This was one of my favorites I think so far from her. And then also An American Sunrise. Um, again, these are both just really short little poetry collections. In this first one, I would say home, the idea of home and place. That is such a recurring theme in her work. Um, and that's definitely something that comes up a lot in this one. I think the best way to um, kind of give you the vibe of these types of works is just to put some actual poetry on the screen for you guys to read. And then for An American Sunrise, I felt like this one was a little bit more modern in a way. It felt a little bit different. There was always, again, a reference to, to her ancestors, but there's also some modern concerns that she puts in here for the first time. I think she even references the 2016 election, if I'm not mistaken, in this one, um, and just kind of like the political state of the world, which isn't something that she's always done. So that one made this a little bit different. Next up was one that I've been really excited to read for a long time. Um, I saw this one in a local bookshop last year, maybe even the year before. Um, and it just looks like such a beautiful springtime read. It's called People From My Neighborhood. It's translated from the Japanese. Um, this is by Hiromi Kawakami. I hope I'm saying her name right. Um, and it's short stories. It's actually like micro fiction. They're called palm of the hand stories in Japanese. The idea is that they're small enough to fit in the palm of your hand, which is such a cute idea. I love it. A lot of them are really only like two or three pages, most of them. They are connected. Um, in the sense that you get, you kind of see the same people who live in the neighborhood pop up in different stories. Um, I felt like we never really got to the meat and potatoes of anything, which kind of makes sense given it's not a novel. I think they're ultimately just intended to be little snapshots of life. They're not really meant to kind of um, unspool a character's entire life story. I did feel like the writing was a little basic, which could just be owed to the fact that it's translated and I feel like there is something inevitably inherently lost in translation. I think in my Instagram review, I said, it's like drinking a boba tea without the boba. Like you keep waiting for like that magic little pop to come and it never really does. It's just a classic situation where you love the cover and it's so beautiful, but then the actual stories inside just don't really, don't really live up to what you thought they might based on that cover. And then coming to the end here, we've got Bury Me Standing, The Gypsies and Their Journey from Isabel Fonseca. This was recommended to me by Pinterest. I know I've said in um, some of my other videos, I don't know what it is about Pinterest. My algorithm is just really spot on. I remember in like eighth grade, we did a whole unit in English class on the Holocaust. And I remember like hearing the word gypsy and like hearing about them. And I think there's been like, a few TV shows and things over the years about gypsies, but I just don't know like anything about them. Now I do. It came out in the 90s. It took the author about four years to write. She actually moved, she's an American author, but she moved temporarily to Albania to live with the Dukas family. They welcomed her in and basically let her live like one of them for, I think it was maybe a couple of months. I don't know if she says for sure. The beginning is 
really awesome. It has such heart because she's there with like getting to meet all the different family members and learning the culture and they kind of take on whatever religion is sort of popular at the time um basically just to avoid any persecution they they talks about a lot about you know their sexuality um a lot of child brides a lot of teenage marriage teenage pregnancy is very normal she talks a lot about this concept of gaje which is um their word for like outsiders um like people who um, are non-gypsies who they typically don't really have any dealings with. She really asks questions like, are they really nomadic by nature? Um, or are they just persecuted and not really allowed to stay for very long in one place and so therefore have to be nomadic? She talks about the period in time that they were enslaved for about 400 years up until I think like eight, 1850. It was certainly a history lesson there at the end. I feel like the first third is amazing it's so she goes into so much detail there are photographs that she includes of this family um, all the different generations and how they welcome her in and all these different um, little blunders that she makes because she's unfamiliar with their with their customs and then the two the like the final two-thirds um, is just a history lesson and it gets very dense and a little bit dry because you kind of lose the heart a little bit once we got away from that family. They are just one of the most amorphous, eclectic cultures I've ever read about. I found it really fascinating. And then the final book of the month is Transit by Rachel Cusk. I completely forgot about her for a couple of months. I started the Outline Trilogy um, whenever that was. I don't even remember um, and really liked it. I like how Cusk is writing a narrator who we don't really learn a lot about specifically we don't learn a lot about her from her own perspective. We sort of see glimpses of her through the conversations that she's having with other people. And so we get an outline, sort of a sketch of who she is based on these conversations. Um, so each chapter focuses on a different conversation with a different person in her life. There's her hairdresser at one point. I really liked that one. Different friends who've come back into her life, old acquaintances um, who she hasn't seen in a really long time. It's all these different people who kind of make up her life. Um, and we start to see a sort of crisper picture of her come into, come into focus. I wouldn't even necessarily say to read these to find out about who she is. She's just kind of a blank canvas in a lot of ways. I read these for the writing style. It almost feels like little vignettes or little short stories. And there's something about the way that Cusk writes that if they keep tumbling forward, they roll right into one another. You finish one and you wanna read onto the next one. There's just something, I don't know what it is, but there's just something about her writing that um, you just wanna keep reading. So I did finish this one in about two days because of that. I would say these books really even aren't intended for the story itself. It's for her descriptions of those little nuances and subtleties of life. Um, and so it could be the tiniest moments. It's usually like one little sentence that's so powerful and electric because it's something that you felt before and maybe not quite had the words for. All right guys, so that is everything. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you're reading in summer. I've got a couple of books coming. I've been like thrifting things on eBay. I'm very excited about them. So thank you guys for watching and I will see you next time. Bye. Ryder. Ryder. Sit. Sit. Good boy. Good boy.